again, R. Steiner. Hello, everyone out there. Welcome to yet another edition of Anime Review, our weekly anime podcast. Joining me today, as always, uh, Deanna. What's up? Hello, and Nusha. Yo. Yo, and I am Zach Reese, your host. So yeah, um, it's been another crazy week in anime. Uh, we got a lot to discuss here. Uh, since we're running a little bit late than we used to, uh, than we usually do, I mean, uh, we're just going to go ahead and get right into it. And so, uh, yeah, it's been kind of crazy. Uh, I will say off the top, uh, I don't know if you guys missed any shows this past week, but I did not catch the most recent episode of Gigigi no Kutaro that aired last night. It airs at like 9 or 10 at night, and sometimes, you know, just forget about watching it when it's that late. So I'll just offer my thoughts on it next week uh, and catch up with the other episode that I aired. So basically what I did last time, catching up on two or three episodes at a time, which is probably how I'm going to approach it, but that's just fine. So instead... Let's get into the next show that's on my list and at the top of everybody else's, Hanibato. So it's it was kind of a fascinating episode. Uh, uh, you know, you can say, tell Ayano she is taking things pretty seriously now. Uh, it's it seems like uh, it, kind of what we thought on the previous episode is that she was going to start to take stuff seriously with Connie around because uh, she's got this relationship with her mother, um, this prodigy. Uh, that it feels like the mom is using the kids as a tool, uh, which is awful, um, but that's kind of the approach that it feels like she's taking with that, and I just cannot believe that s- there's, there's got to be something going on there. You just can't have something like that, but who knows? That's just kind of how some people roll, I guess. But, uh, Deanna, what were your thoughts on this episode? I'm quite shocked that the girl in the picture uh, was Connie. I thought it was a different woman. Did you guys think that was connie oh no i thought it was connie uh, but oh. uh, uh, just that she was uh, i think i mentioned it before that you know she was kissing her uh the, the mother uh but uh, on the cheek but she was blonde haired so it's like who knows because they keep throwing in all these other characters but i kind of did i don't know about you nusha uh i wasn't so sure i didn't really expect it but i guess it was just her with short hair that they explained later yeah that she grew it mm-hmm. out uh I don't know, to maybe impress her mother. I don't know what the situation is. Or yeah, maybe to look, look more, more like her. Like... <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Oh. <laughs> Trigger that PTSD. Oh my god, it was even worse. Um, but <laughs> they brought back the quality animation from the uh, once again, which it seems like that's what they were talking about uh, during some of the updates about the show, that they were going to start combining some of the, the animation styles so that won't pretty much blow the budget, you know? Uh, but for what it's worth, uh, it blended very well together like you had some of those moments that you could tell that they were trying to cut back a little bit but still have some smooth uh, uh a smooth look to it but the actual action shots were incredible and so i was i was really happy about that as someone who d- has never really paid attention to badminton in his life uh i just kind of really liked it and it showed how intense things can really get um and you know it, it's it's like even more intense than say volleyball because uh like if you decide to, uh, you know, get yourself out of position even for a smidge, uh, you're completely wrecked. And then, of course, the, the whenever the Batman hits against the net, you feel like <laughs> like the world is ending. Um, I can imagine how uh, painful that must be. But it just goes to show uh, how, how how things were getting. Uh, but yeah, it was I, I, once again really solid episode. How do you guys think about it so far? I mean, we're what like uh, what is this f- five episodes, four episodes in? I forget. I think it's four. Yeah. How do you think uh, about so far? We're about third, third of the way. Yeah, I'm. I'm liking it. I felt like. Tell me if you guys think differently. I feel like some of the, the character moments were kind of weird in this episode. Like they jumped, pretty far. Like, how, why did Connie suddenly have that change of heart towards her teammate? Because yeah, that kind of. <laughs> Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's just like she was like she was this huge asshole about it, and then she has like a leg spasm, and then she's like, "I feel so bad for the way I treated my teammate." But it's like I didn't really see anything happen that would have like changed her mind, like convinced her that she was acting like an asshole. I don't know. It seemed a little like there was a step that we missed in that that arc. Yeah, I feel like Connie doesn't deserve her teammates, honestly. Yeah, but it seems like they're already willing to like forgive her for everything. 
I don't know. I mean, for me, it's that I think that maybe Connie was so caught up in what she was doing and that maybe I, I, I will agree, though, that never really alluded to her being a really nice person outside of this game. Like they didn't say something like, oh, Connie's changed. Like, what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's more like she's always like this. <laughs> she's constantly yeah, exactly. she's full of herself or at least she's got uh, a big head. But I don't know. Uh, you know, hopefully they address that further down the line. But yeah, it felt like that was completely 180 from what a character was being until like suddenly mm -hmm. fan service. You know, I just they do that stuff. Yeah, that was pretty blatant. Yeah, it was, it was pretty blatant. I was like, I was kind of thinking like maybe the show won't be like that. No, but it's, yeah. it's not like it, it ruined it or anything. Like that'd be kind of silly. But I just thought that was uh, yeah. I do agree that uh, that could have been better explained. But I yeah. assume maybe they do a better job in the in the. In, in the in the in the text than they do yeah you were saying that the like the pacing was a little off from the manga so maybe that's something they rectify but also like what did you guys think about sora's moment you know the the girl who usually has her eyes closed and then she like suddenly she gives oh. i know these like, words of inspiration or whatever see this is the thing like me and deanna were talking about this uh while walking around after, during break and so i totally mm -hmm. um forgot that that was part of the episode yeah um it's definitely a revealing moment and you wonder what exactly does she i mean it's clear that she felt like uh, she said it as much too that towards the end of that episode that you know uh, she was upset with ayano because she thought that you know she was using all these uh, she had this great uh, natural ability and then she was i don't know like felt like maybe she was rubbing it in i don't know what the what the whole context of what she was upset about um, yeah it just seemed kind of out of nowhere yeah, a little bit. Like it's it's like, it, did they do it just so that she would have some development as a character? Because anybody else could have had that same sort of feeling. Yeah, so, exactly. I don't know. I feel like you could have swapped her for any other teammate in that moment, and it would have been the same <laughs> moment. So it, it just seemed kind of from left field. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, is Sora the one who called out Ayano for making up excuses when yes. she lost? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's uh, hopefully she gets her arc soon enough as well. Uh, other than this, because mm -hmm. otherwise, yeah, I assume it's because yeah, they'll, maybe they'll delve deeper into like you know how how seriously she takes this. But so far, it doesn't really feel like she's a standout character. But I'm um, looking forward to whatever they do, because um, right now it doesn't seem like she really deserved that type of attitude. Yeah, <laughs> she suddenly got the spotlight, and I was like, wait, who's this again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's... like you could have given that moment to like you or even uh nagisa or even the coach like anyone else could have had that moment but sora comes up and i'm like i don't know who you are yeah no actually i was kind of curious i looked up the um the manga and apparently it's way more focused on the coach like the, the whole angle is, is really? from the coach's perspective uh that he comes into this team and has to like put bring them together but this is from a different perspective and that's why i'm thinking that they're saying that the uh, the uh, pacing is different because it's about the team. It's about the team itself, not the coach. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, that that seems like a pretty huge change. That would change like a lot of things more than just pacing. Well, yeah, it, it, like even from like the synopsis alone. Like, let me quickly pull this up so that I, I can kind of give you what what it says as the. Uh... Okay, yeah, here it is. Tachibana Kentaro is a high school badminton coach who has a lot more enthusiasm than some of the members of his very small team. One day he meets the Clyde boy student Hanasaki Ayano, there you go, who is effortlessly uh, physically capable and experienced in badminton. He tries to recruit her, but he, she seems to have no interest in the sport at all. Due to a series of circumstances, she eventually ends up joining the team. Coach Tachibana is determined with, that with her on board, they'll be champions. So it's totally from the coach's uh, you know, perspective. So that's it's a hmm. big change. Uh, but I guess that's why, you know, they wanted to change things up for the anime and, you know, all the uh, like, good on them uh, for not trying to, you know, just straight up adapt the material one to one. So I'm curious to see what else they do. And I guess in that way, it'll change up people's, uh, you know, expectations for what they expect if they read the manga. So uh, hmm. I'll, I'll have to wait and see about that. Oh, I didn't show the picture. So, yeah, that's one of the, the shots from Hanibato uh, when she went into the zone, I guess you would say. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, when her eyes get all like dilated i guess i don't know what the situation here is so. do you guys feel exhausted from all the like high emotions that are in each episode it it can be i mean the first episode was pretty intense and then after that it seemed to like you know calm down a bit but i guess maybe they'll that's what they're planning on as far as the uh the pacing as we talked about that it's going to be intense for a couple episodes and then relax a bit but even then on those episodes when it's kind of supposed to be relaxing you still get like a lot of 
drama. So I don't know. Yeah, I haven't hit with I haven't been hit with like the whiplash yet. Like it seems like the the tone's being handled pretty well so far, but I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm curious to find out. How about you, Diana? Yeah, I don't think it's really hit me either, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just so much drama, and then um, we haven't really gotten like I really like uh, Aragaki. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. Of, I, I kind of miss seeing her like badass, like badminton uh, skills, and just her being a little angry. But I guess her character arc was like very short and just moved on to Ayano. Oh god. Yeah, it's kind of a shame because she seems a little more interesting than Ayano right now, at least for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I'd like to see more of her. Yeah, she's had her moments, like when she helped her, like even like the previous episode when they were helping uh, at the park. So. I, th I, uh, I guess that would be two episodes ago, but like uh, I think she, for me, yeah, she is the uh, the most interesting character. So I hope they do bring her back in. But I assume it's just because like you can't have the focus always be on one person. They have to kind of mm -hmm. go around the horn, and then they'll come back to her. I hopefully, hopefully, because she's the captain. So you know that's that'd be important if they did that. Yeah, I definitely don't think her like arc's done. She's got to have more. But mm -hmm. plenty of episodes left um maybe it'll even go longer maybe there'll be another season so who knows it's hard to say uh so far from what i've seen a lot of people are really excited about this and it always has to do with streaming numbers and apparently this has been doing pretty well for them so uh that mm -hmm. might encourage them to yeah invest in more seasons uh but yeah uh, other than that uh from moving on from Hanibato, uh i don't have a picture for chio school road but it was another crazy episode where like chio needs to find a bathroom because she decided to drink like this giant jug of tea been there and uh she runs into the men's best bathroom uh and th she finds out on because the men's bathroom was closer so she decided to duck into that point but then of course to uh you know maintain her ability as like a maiden that she needs to uh escape from there but men keep coming in because it's right next to a bus station and so at one point she uses her chakra which is uh you know she's got like this video game power that she like summons her chakra from within so that she can real life wall hack which you know means like see through walls and they play during this <laughs> during this transition um they play an opening song to naruto shippuden <laughs> which was a nice no touch way. <laughs> you just hear the i thought this like, was a slice of life she has superpowers <laughs> no it's it's totally fake she's like it's just oh like, it <laughs> yeah it's it was um it was a stupid uh, moment that I, I made me laugh because I was like, wait a second. I heard the vocals. I'm like, this is dumb. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, because the, the way this is all um, uh, laid out, it's usually like it's two parts. Every episode is made up of two separate parts that just push together. Kind of like a four coma, like Nichijou, but it's just two. Uh, so the next part was just about how awful Chio and Manana, uh, they're all like awful friends to each other. And so like there's a student council monitor who sees them doing all these dumb things like... At one point, Shiro rips this flower out of the ground because it's got like a really long vine and just starts whipping Monono with it. And then uh, she gets Monono gets a stick, and they just start having a big fight about it. And then they just set their stuff down and just move on their way like nothing happened. Uh, and, and at one point, uh, this girl approaches her. Uh, excuse me. This the student council monitor approaches them to like prove their friendship because they they have been so mean to each other, and otherwise she'll they'll, like reprimand them. Uh, for being mean to each other and then they do this stupid like cat dance <laughs> that I just couldn't figure out they call it the Manana Chio because uh, their names put together of course and it's just like a meow 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 they do this like cat dance it was this show is so <laughs> it sounds damn... like a fever dream Zach. it is it is a fever dream it's so damn ridiculous at times that uh you know sometimes you just kind of sit back like what the hell is this show <laughs> uh, but I, I I've been enjoying it. It's still like I think it's tops as far as comedy this season for me. I'm just it's when they started that dance, I just couldn't stop laughing because it's so ridiculous. Um, but uh, so yeah, people want a good laugh this season. That's maintains uh, to be a really good show for me. So I just wanted to share some thoughts about that. So let's go from comedy to what it seems to be once again a little more serious. Gintama Silver Soul Two. So Deanna. Looks like the show continues to up the, up the drama. Yeah, so this week's episode was very action heavy, and the action was pretty spot on. Um, it's nowhere near as like good as Attack on Titan, but um, with the fights in Gintama, uh, they use a lot of swords, and um, every hit and slash that they uh, 
do, it's like full of impact and the show's not afraid of keeping their characters bleeding. <laughs> so it's like, they're just like dripping in blood all the time. <laughs> um, oh God. Yeah. So that character right there, that's Ensho and he's one of the main villains in this space battle. And the episode started with him, uh, with his backstory and it kind of showed how he's very shady. <laughs> like, um, it was like a flashback to when his older brother was alive and Ensho didn't provide support during this battle because he has feelings for his older brother's wife. So basically he let his older brother die <laughs> just so he can get uh, his, his wife. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it went back to the present and then um, Takasugi, the guy from last week that I mentioned, he was the star of the episode. Um, he basically fought against him one-on-one -on -one and dealt the killing blow. And it was just like, it was so great to see um, this. these characters have their shining moment as like um, samurai. So yeah, it was really good. Next week, we're gonna go back to Earth and focus on Gintoki and everyone else, plus Sada Haru, the dog. And these two characters, um, they're like priestesses or whatever, but they're sisters. And they appeared during the earlier episodes of Gintama and they're they're important to like um, Sada Haru's backstory, I guess. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm from what I saw, it's like the, the comedy is going to come back. <laughs> That's good. Because, yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, it looks like the, at least the animation quality is uh, really good. Yeah. So, it yeah. has its moments. It yeah. has its moments, though. But it's if they bring the comedy back, I don't know. It's like are they? I, I assume that they've been able to balance that pretty well anyway. Like in the past, so maybe it won't be such a bad bad situation. So, I, I uh, let us know how that goes because that seems pretty crazy. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, with that, then we'll move on to the next a bit here. Uh, so we'll talk about a show that you and Nusha both watch, Indiana, and that's Banana Fish. So you talked about how serious the last episode got as far as the death of a character. Uh, how did they balance it with this episode? Uh... <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have Nusha talk on this one then, since he's been watching. Okay. Too. Oh, you want me to? Okay. Uh... Balance is a funny way to put it because it seems like it's just going dark, 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 dark. I don't really see this as having like oh boy. the hero treatment where it's like a light arc and then a dark arc. No, this is just you're you're getting in for death and gang <laughs> politics and stuff like that. Um, that being said, though, the episode was really enthralling. Like they, Ash has been in jail for the past uh, few episodes, and this is the episode where he finally gets out, and so it's nice to see the plots actually progressing. Like I was expecting him to be in jail for like a large portion of the story. And it was nice to see him actually get out. And he's kind of lost his gang at this point. It's been taken over by a rival of his named Arthur, who's looking to be a pretty big antagonist for the series, but he's kind of amassing his own like ragtag gang now. Like he's got a, the photographer, or AG, sorry, the photographer. He's got Max, the guy who he met in prison who actually served in the war with his brother. And who's the guy I'm forgetting? He's got Shorter also, like one uh, straggler from like his old gang that still is loyal to Ash. And so it's nice to see him kind of create a new group, like a new family to help him with his endeavors. But that being said, he's also very... Because in the last episode, we mentioned his brother was killed. And so he's very driven by revenge right now. And so all the characters that are in his gang right now are kind of a nice foil to that. Because they're all telling him he's being crazy. And they're trying to hold him back. But he's kind of this... He's lashing out right now. And so there was a scene where Max knocks him out. Because he's just he keeps trying to go after these guys. Keeps putting everyone in trouble. And Max just like knocks his fucking lights out. Oh, and boy. I immediately fell in love with Max. Like I was the entire time I was watching this episode. I was like Ash needs to stop. He's putting everyone in danger. And then as soon as I thought that Max just knocks him out. And I was like okay. I can get behind <laughs> this character. But uh, it's nice. Yeah like he's gathering a, a group. A family. And they're all very nice foils to each other. And it looks like they're going to Cape Cod, Cape Cod next. Yeah. It's like where he grew up, and I guess there's something there that they can find out about Banana Fish by going to Cape Cod. So the plot's going places, and I'm 
it's it's still got me gripped. Like I still want to find out what happens. What did you think, Diana? Yeah, we got to see Ag's past um, with his pole vaulting, and uh, I guess that serves as like a motive motivator for like why he's sticking with Ash because he wants to like finish what he started, which I guess is to just like um, help Ash out with his situation. Um, so I thought <laughs> Ag was was like a badass for just driving that car off with Ash. Like I don't know if that like. <laughs> threw you off but um i saw this meme of someone putting the initial d like song when oh, uh, of course she was driving <laughs> off so it's like your own beat intensifies so i thought that was hilarious oh my gosh <laughs> but um i think so ash's plan where he like they drove the truck into that club i don't know if that was like the best plan that they could have come up with <laughs> Because it's kind of like, let's just run this truck straight toward the club and endanger innocent civilians. Yeah, and then I'll stand on top of the truck yeah. and take a very stable shot at oh. the, the um, gang leader. And that yeah. didn't really work out. <laughs> but yeah, Dino is scum. I really hope he dies in the worst possible way. Because like, yeah, the whole child prostitution club was just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You remember um, when I said dark? Yeah. Oh my God. Does that bother you, Nusha? Like the fact that what? it just keeps getting dark and dark, like... Uh, you think that they're like hammering that theme in? I think certain series can get kind of exhausting with it, but I feel like I knew what I was getting into when I signed up for this show, you know? Uh-huh. Like the the synopsis even like explains that Ash was like a sex slave for a point. And I was like, okay, I know what I'm signing up oh, for boy. here. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's it's definitely got its like its little glimmers of light with like the relationship between Ash and AG and stuff like that. And I'm not exhausted by it yet, but We'll see. Yeah. And also the the ending when Ash was um looking at the sunset and crying about his brother. Oh my god. And like the ending <laughs> the ending song was the acoustic version, so I was like, that like ripped my heart out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean I feel like cause Ash never really had a chance to mourn for his brother. Um and so it was like that moment where he just like kind of was very vulner vulnerable. Mm hmm I agree. That was a good moment. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it's been getting into a pretty good position right now. If, if people are looking for uh, a mixture of dark and depressing storylines, but also like redeeming moments, uh, that seems pretty crazy. So uh, we're checking out if people are looking into like a more action drama style. Uh, with that, then uh, let's talk about something else. Uh, that's let's let's get something some more lighthearted then because we've been going through these uh, some of these more uh dark roads uh that we've got some attack on titan yeah uh, <laughs> no cells at work let's talk about cells at work i know nusha it looks like you were looking to drop that show so uh oh it's dropped uh, yeah yeah it's already, it's already dropped so in this episode we learned about cedar pollen allergies um and we get introduced to the memory cell uh who retains memories of pathogens uh and who speaks of the harbinger of calamity, which is just like the series on unfortunate events uh, that causes nasal congestion and inflammation, uh, repetitive sneezing, things like that. Um, I forget the name of the voice actor, but I could easily tell who Memory Cell is voiced by. It's the Kiyosuke from uh, Oi no Emoto, uh, or, uh, you know, My Sister is Stupid, or something like that. Uh, I can't believe my sister is like this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a pretty good show uh, that had some pretty crazy moments here like it once again the facial reactions sell the whole series for me and it's it's always great to see the return of some of these characters still no platelets which is a bit of a shame uh but i did love the fact that when they introduced the steroid <laughs> into it uh he, it's a giant robot that looks like a terminator uh which is accurate since you know steroids can be both good and bad uh it just made me realize just how crazy things can be even when you have allergies, and that practically every episode so far has been kind of like that. It's been a little overwhelming at times, but it also makes you second guess, I guess, about taking medication when unnecessary because some crazy things can happen there. Uh, it really goes to show that your body is constantly at war with itself, uh, having to deal with all these, uh, you know, uh, invaders uh, while also trying to maintain its own, uh, you know, functionality uh so it's it's been it's been great and once again the red blood cell and white blood cell really sell the experience for me so it's been great so far what about you diana i think this was the funniest episode <laughs> yes. for oh me like gosh. it was just 
like moments like when the red blood cell just rolled in that steroid <laughs> and then it was like a replay reel oh. of my blood cell <laughs> yeah it was like a replay reel and I was like that was that was good and then um the memory cell is basically a conspiracy theorist yes. <laughs> and everything <laughs> he says true. is yeah it all came true and then I love the when the episode break came on he screams like Hataraku Saibo but it was like a real like jarring scream so that was really funny <laughs> um and when you were talking about platelets like even though they weren't like the main like they weren't really in the spotlight um they're in the background and as this apocalyptic chaos was going on i was just like protect them at all costs <laughs> all the histamines coming through and just destroying everything like a flood uh, yeah oh my god when they when they're like when they're like oh let's change the nozzle it was like a small nozzle and then there's like this big ass <laughs> nozzle and they're just like oh shit i know <laughs> it went so from like funny. a little hose to like a gigantic like cannon or something there's a water cannon uh yeah it was great uh and, and once again it just got really over the top uh, and just how like they were fighting with each other having to deal with like whose job is what uh man like it, it continues to be that way uh it <laughs> I, I did think it was kind of funny, too, that they would always break in the action to explain what's going on every single time. So, like, something bad's happening. And then this, like, very calm, soothing voice just comes in and explains how the, what was happening. Like, oh, these, these are antihistamines. Oh, these are the... Um uh the the allergens uh and this is once again like nasal congestion this is what the inflammation that creates tears and this is why all this water is here it's 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 just like this uh, this chaos like this calm within the chaos like uh, the eye of the storm happening constantly it's just it's so bizarre um mm -hmm. and been super informative at the same time like i'm not saying you're taking notes about what's going on with the body but it once again shows off just how chaotic it can be so i, I appreciate that yeah, next week's episode, we're getting backstory on the white blood cell. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. I wonder what's going to go on there. That's that's kind of crazy. Because so far, they haven't really talked about any of the, of the other white blood cells, just this one. Uh, so I assume maybe they'll talk about the other people in the, in the group and how they, you know, maybe helped him get used to his role. I don't know. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. With that... Nisha, are you going to check out... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Nisha, are you going to check out that Grimdark spinoff? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, no. <laughs> okay. I like that that's what you think my taste is now. <laughs> Grim Dark? What, what the, Grim the, Dark? They're doing like a... I guess the manga has a spinoff where it's just... It's like a female white blood cell and a male red blood cell. And instead of like this comedic light tone, it's like very dark and gruesome and brutal. Oh yeah, like same you story. It. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah, like the guy that they're living inside like smokes and has like a bunch of diseases and <laughs> he's like middle aged and all. Yeah, exactly. So they're fighting off like these giant bacteria every day. I'm definitely gonna read that. That sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like I would definitely want to check that out. That's awesome. And like the platelets are like child soldiers. <laughs> oof. oof. <laughs> Well, you said you wanted more platelets. Yeah, uh, that's one way. Uh, but I want the cute and adorable platelets. I don't want the, you know, the awful. <laughs> that makes me realize just how awful kids, uh, child soldiers are. Uh, <laughs> well, on that note, talking about child soldiers, let's get to Sirius the Jaeger. So, uh, I've not se seen a, a bit oh. of this, but how's, how's it been? Uh, go ahead, Deanna. You were texting. <laughs> Nusha, how pissed off were you at this episode? Oh my god. I just, <laughs> the last episode, I was like, if they keep focusing on this romantic interest, I'm going to lose my shit. And this episode was 98% romantic interest. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it just sucks when anime shows like use girls as either a roadblock or a plot device to keep the story going. Like, I don't hate her, but I just wish like she didn't have to take on this kind of role just for the sake of the story yeah. or a potential like unnecessary romance. Yeah, yeah, it just seems like the author was like, well, you know, there's usually love interest in shows like this, so mine has <laughs> to have one. And it's like the most basic, bare, nothing behind it love interest. And it's just like everything else is so much more interesting. Just focus on that. I don't know why you have to keep bringing this. She's definitely, she's definitely going to be like a hostage or something and like oh yeah the reason why the mission fails or whatever oh yeah so, but what did but you yeah. think of everything else going on because there's like a lot more plot wise that they're introducing here like the different factions and stuff like that yeah so i guess with the vampires um there's some uh tension between the royals i guess like they're the older ones or whatever they are more focused on getting the arc whereas 
the younger ones, I guess, uh, they <laughs> want to kind of use that Frankenstein to, I guess, take over the world or something. Yeah, like so, there's one, I guess there's one group that we still don't know what the arc of Sirius is. They keep mentioning it, but apparently their race is like dying out. And so there's like two factions and then one is trying to sell those Frankenstein monsters to like the Japanese to make money. And that's how they plan to like raise up their group. And the other guy, Yevgraf or whatever his name was, uh, is trying to find this arc of Sirius that somehow is going to help his his race. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Hyako party or the samurai. And I guess right now they're just out for revenge because reasons. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they like lost their funding. Yeah. <laughs> that's one way. Uh, but also that cliffhanger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> his brother just like casually walks up to him and then like boom end credits song starts <laughs> i i kind of like that really? like, yeah it was it was it was like a nice little subvert like you watched the second season of attack on titan right yeah yeah so like you know that moment where like bert holt and reiner were just like yeah we're the titans <laughs> it was like it was kind of like that it was a nice little like there was no build-up there was no music this whole episode's like i need to find my brother i need to find my brother and then he just pops up and he's like sup <laughs> and it cuts and it cuts the credits and i was like oh yeah i want to check out the next episode yeah i guess i can see the appeal <laughs> it just felt so like it was just like so casual and like i'm so used to like high tension cliffhangers you know but yeah <laughs> no that's that's not that's not the show at all it seems like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're definitely throwing a lot plot wise into this. And I still I'm not huge on the main character still. Like mm -hmm. a couple episodes ago he was like he was it was kinda interesting because he was questioning whether or not he wants to kill all these vampires. He's like, Well, now that I know my brother's one and like I killed one and I like orphaned this poor child, I don't even know if I want to kill all these vampires anymore. And then you cut to this episode and he's saying it again. He's like, I'll kill all the vampires. I'm like, well, what happened to that interesting little turn your character took two <laughs> weeks ago? So it just seems a little... Forced. Forced and just like... I don't know. Yeah, forced is a good way to put it. Yeah. Inconsistent. Inconsistent is the word. One-dimensional. Yeah. They tried, think, but they couldn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think this show is just going to be a bunch of ups and downs. Like, some episodes are going to be good, and then others are just going to be really bad. Yeah. I think so. I'm still watching it, so yeah. <laughs> I guess they're doing yeah. something, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, that's good to hear. That's been so good. Um, I want to get to another show then on that same note that has been keeping my interest pretty strong since the beginning, and that's Angels of Death. Boy, this episode went some places. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, Nusha, of course, you're the only other person uh, watching this with me, but um, I thought that the animation was particularly like menacing in a way uh, in this episode like kathy's expressions were really good like even from like the first few mm. minutes like when she was on the monitor like the way she was acting uh her body her, her face just like contorted uh with what was going on and it was good to see and and this is like we're showing a picture right now of zach and and uh you know dealing with outside in the rain so we finally get some backstory on Zach. Uh, so we kind of got a little bit of that. Like, all we know is that he doesn't like liars, which I hope they explore more because they still didn't really address that here. Uh, but so Kathy, uh, who's the uh, the villain of this floor that he, that they're on, uh, Zach and Rachel, uh, she's forced them to go through like a series of punishments, like just uh, just a, which is made up a bunch of uh, riddles and puzzles and things like that. And if they lose, they die. So they managed to get out of the poison room that they were in. But then Kathy forces Zach to set up this dollhouse uh, using clues that Rachel has to feed to Zach to figure things out, which makes him basically relive his life, his nightmares. Uh, so it, it seems like he was, uh, I don't know if he was originally an orphan, uh, which it makes it seem like they adopted him along with all these other kids, like this foster family. But they're apparently super villainy, <laughs> it's like really over the top in their villainy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so one of the kids dies and they basically for Zach to bury him uh, so uh, I, I I thought it was kind of odd I don't know about you uh, Nushal but that Kathy I, I hope they explain this further that Kathy would know like this particular history about mm -hmm. uh, Zach's character like how he had to bury this so they basically like relive every single because uh, at some point Zach goes to sleep uh, with Rachel next to him and uh, he has this nightmare about having to bury this kid 
and she, Kathy in the, the very next scene makes him like recreate that moment with like a diorama with a dollhouse uh, to to uh, basically like haunt him some more about what's going on here. Uh, they do so show some flashbacks of Zach's past, and there's this person that he's kissing who has pink hair, and I wonder if maybe that's Kathy. Uh, but uh, I don't know what if that's the case, but that'll really show because they're really stretching out this particular person like kathy's still alive and we're going into the third episode next week so clearly she's gotten a very important role here otherwise they would have taken care of her a lot sooner than that since eddie was you know taking care of like in an episode um mm-hmm. but it's also that the relationship between zach and rachel really sells the show to me uh i don't typically get into shows like this or they have to be especially interesting to keep my interest i guess uh, and this one does. So I, I just thought pound for pound, this was a great episode and I'm, I'm still really enjoying it. Some stuff was, yeah, once again, a little over the top, but I, I still uh, found a lot to keep my uh, uh, keep my interest uh, from week to week. So uh, what about you, Nushal, though? Yeah, that was definitely a question I was asking myself as well, was how Kathy has all this information on Zach. And yeah. it seems like her entire floor is just kind of modeled around poking and prodding at him like she wants him to remember his past she wants to keep like harassing him about the stuff he's done and hammer home this idea of like paying for your sins and and guilt and punishment and so i think you're right there might be some kind of connection between the two because she's getting a lot of screen time and like you said eddie was just like one-shotted he was like pushed into a grave and that was it said and done (laughs) meanwhile kathy's like taking up a third of this series right now we still have like what three or four more killers to go through but uh, uh, and that yeah. that guy is on the on the poster the the what seems to be the head honcho with his suit. Mm-hmm. So exactly, and so it's it's still interesting though. This has definitely got me gripped right now, and like the dynamic, like you said, between the two main characters is very comedic, but also very there's something deeper there that's keeping me coming back every week. Uh, I really like that little comedic flourish they did where she was walking really slow. <laughs> yeah. And then he, He's walking ahead real quick, and all you see is just a shot of the hallway, and then he quickly turns around and, like, speed walks back to her, and you hear this quick little horror movie violin twinge, like, dun 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 and it, it got me. Like, it got me hard. Um, what else? Uh, it doesn't take itself too seriously, which I love. Yeah, exactly. And it seemed like the first two episodes, that's what they were doing. It was really dark, really gruesome, like there was no comedic moments, and it was just kind of too much. But now they've kind of leveled it out, and I like where they're taking the tone. And it seems like they're really, I think they mentioned again something about like a, a crime or some kind of guilt that Rachel is going through. Yeah. And there's got to be a reason she's in this scenario right now. So I'm interested to see if maybe like one of the other floors, I'm willing to bet the floor with the priest is going to be where we get some of her backstory. Absolutely. That's what it, I mean, clearly because she's got this close connection to God. So I wonder if maybe mm-hmm. she was raised in the church or something like that. But I'm, um, I'll, I'll be curious to find out what exactly is going on there. But yeah, so far, just this is the, one of the shows between this and maybe uh, Honey Bado, like the two shows that I really look forward to watching the next episode to every week. Uh, you know, even if I started it late, I'm just having a great time with it. And like you said, there's these very comedic moments. Uh, and it's just great. Like when he was shoving the key card into the slot, but he had it reversed around. <laughs> yeah. not look at the arrow that tells you. It's like, it's a very, like, uh, it's kind of like a grandpa moment that he has. The way he's like, <laughs> no, there's an arrow that tells you the way you're supposed to insert the key card. And he didn't do it. He bent the card on it instead. So uh, it just kind of shows that he's... A really stupid kid. He probably did not have any education whatsoever. So it's it's once again like uh, he's really selling it for me and Rachel. Those moments that she has, um, looking mm-hmm. forward to it. So it's definitely the brain and brawn dynamic going on here. Oh, totally. She's apparently super smart. Like she figured out the riddles immediately. So she just yeah. had to close her eyes and she figured things out. You know, clearly she's smart. So actually, that actually uh, is a good transition. Then let's talk about My Hero Academia. Uh, sometimes we save this to last, but I figured this is such a good transition. Let's go right into it. So, uh, what we get here today, so they're still in the midst of this provisional licensing exam, uh, that they go through. And so we've left a lot of that stuff behind. Um, uh, Todoroki gets his moment and takes care of the ninjas. That's kind of like, that's, that was going to happen anyway. Like it was pretty obvious that he was going to overwhelm them in any case. So, 
that happens. But now we get this new character who's this leader of what seems to be like, I don't know if it's like an all girl school or something like that, but Miss Sai, uh, she's actually got the quirk that I would most want. Um, she's got extremely high level of intelligence that <laughs> I guess it's kind of, I don't know if it, it'd be, have to be this specific, but like uh, she, uh, depending on the kind of tea that she drinks, it, it, uh, she, here she's able to exponentially increase her intelligence, uh, her IQ. Uh, she's like, they made it clear like, she's already got an iq of 150 but this makes it even higher i was like okay all right but <laughs> it's it was uh, it was great um i uh, uh, there was some weird moments in this episode too I, I will say there was a lot of monologuing going on there was a lot of talking uh which was you know it, it was okay because uh, you get to know the people there uh i did think that the moment that they thought that oh like was it miss i pulled in what was the i'm sorry what was what's the girl's name with the black hair Momo? Yeah, Momo. Uh, she pulled Momo in to, like, t take care of her and advance to, you know, the pr provisional exam. But, like, I thought that was a little bit forced because it's one of her and there were multiple students. Like, yeah, why wouldn't they just go ahead and... Because there was more, actually, of the female students that they were going against than th they them themselves. So it was like, yeah, already there's, you know, this uneven amount. Why wouldn't they just take care of them all while they're still there, you know? Just might as well. Um and, you know, it, but at the same time, like a lot of this material can be vital because we're learning more about sort of the thought processes behind the, the characters and their problem solving abilities. So it was pretty fascinating. And I also liked how um, Deku even explains how this entire test is about the ability for them to work as a group of heroes and not sort of going for their individual glory. Uh, and, you know, Momo, I, I, one of the things I will say about Momo before i pass it on uh, to one of you guys it's that i did like how she's got like this book of blueprints for the different devices that she has they kind of showed that earlier in the series about you know part of her costume is that she's got a place for her book because she needs to know how each thing that she makes functions in order to make it work and i thought that was a really nice touch you know and like she doesn't want to do anything like half haphazardly she needs to understand what she's making before she does something you know totally you know uh, uh she to ends up doing something bad so diana what do you think about this episode uh it's like you said uh there's a lot of talking but yeah. can't be helped uh but i also really um loved when aizawa talked about uh the effect that deku and bakugo have on their classmates oh yeah so it's just like you can you can see like how they're determined to become better heroes based on like these two students. Um, and you can tell like Deku is on his way of becoming like All Might, but not like a carbon copy, just like the influence that he already carries. Yeah. So more so than Bakugo, because Bakugo is just an angry boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But yeah, speaking of Bakugo, like um, I guess we're going to start getting into that fight with that one dude who has this really disgusting quirk. Oh my god, what was that? It <laughs> turned like a, like this like it it seems like it like deforms their body into like this goo that he just mashes together and just drops them on the ground. Like how do you make him return to normal after that? That's Isn't that painful? <laughs> like I would expect agonized screaming or something. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have a mouth anymore. I don't know how he would Oh, that's true. scream. He turned best boy into Plato. <laughs> I, I do like how they, they made fun of his eye like Bakugo made fun of his eyes like no they're very long and handsome <laughs> it's like oh yeah. <laughs> his sass was great <laughs> yeah good sass but oh my gosh like uh, that was part of the most disgusting power I've ever seen so far it's like Majibu <laughs> levels of like oh I feel so uncomfortable with this oh, I just can't <laughs> but yeah it, it's great and uh, clearly you know they were talking about it uh uh, about how they're, they're two standout students that lead people along. You didn't really think about that so much with Bakugo, but it's his passion and his charisma that carries people with him. So uh, it's crazy to think that not that long ago, it felt like Bakugo was going to swing uh, to the dark side, <laughs> in a way. Because um, I've never read the manga, so I just kind of assumed that that's where the arc was going to take a turn, like the Sasuke of, of, the, of the series. But I'm glad at least... Thank that... God it didn't. Oh yeah. my God, I hated that arc so much. It's like, are you it kidding? so bad. Yeah. Don't be like that. And actually, I, I wanted to show something here. It's that this is actually kind of interesting. Um, uh, just this past week, they were showing uh, this, uh, these, uh, excuse me, these like uh, prototypes of Deku uh, that uh, that was drawn by the artist himself. And so, oh yeah, the original designs. Yes, and so I'm showing some pictures that we've got here. 
And so, uh, Deku was once a sickly salary man named Jack Midoriya. Uh, and this is from 2008. Uh, this is like a first draft of his sorts, but it was that he's, he works at a company that sells superhero supplies. And so Jack, you to be a hero in his own right, but he was too ill to do so. So apparently he was very sickly at some point, which I'm glad he isn't because that's kind of overdone anyway. It was kind of silly. It's like without powers, he's already kind of underpowered as it is. Like he's, he's... He's not super powered, so clearly that was already kind of a given here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's an, another shot that we've got here too. Um, another prototype here. Uh, a younger but still depressing looking <laughs> Midoriya, <laughs> uh, but a much more savage looking Deku costume, which I kind of liked. But I'm glad that they found like that perfect medium when they created the actual like Deku though. So uh, yeah. it definitely fits in more here. It's um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the manga. Because I actually had like a copy of it by my side while I was watching this episode because I didn't really remember much. But this entire episode, most of it actually was anime exclusive. Like all the villains and stuff that they fought, like Intelli, Sai, and the ninjas and stuff. Oh, wow. Those were all anime exclusive, actually. And um, I'm usually really skeptical about episodes like that. But it seems like they handled it really well this time because I think the two main things I had to hammer home was like, momo's character and then the influence that deku and bakugo have because that part was actually in the manga and so i think they did a good job because one of momo's like character arcs so far was that she was scared to implement her own plans or to take lead because she had this like inferiority complex with characters like todoroki and stuff and so they kind of you kind of got to see her quote unquote like evolved form now. She's not afraid to take charge or like come up with plans. And it's because of her intellect that they actually got out of that situation. And so it was nice to see that even though this was like an anime exclusive episode, they handled the characters with like dignity and class and actually treated them like I like I assume how Horikoshi would have written those characters in those moments. So I appreciated it. Absolutely. And I'm I'm just been enjoying it so much so far. Uh, like like I said, I like Masai as a character. I hope she makes a return. Um, because you know it, I think it, she's a one off. Oh my gosh, that sucks. Okay. She was entirely anime exclusive, so I don't think she'll be coming back. Oh, that's a shame. I like I like I, I think it's more like her quirk is so fascinating. Um, but I guess we'll have to move on from that. So, yeah, once again, very strong episode of My Hero Academia. Uh, all the monologuing aside, you know, it's building up to something big, and I assume like the last few people that can get to the top 100 uh that'll be where it gets its it reaches its peak so we'll find out soon enough it's already at what 60 people in so they have to figure that out soon deku is still not in there so we'll find out yeah on that note let's talk more about some action plights here with planet with so once again crazy looking mech thing here <laughs> got a picture of. uh how, how was this episode nusha uh, it was good. The series is actually taking a, a different spin, which I appreciate because I think I mentioned this before, but it seemed like every episode was following this format of a UFO touches down on Earth, the paladins take care of them, and then our main character, Kuroi, uh, ambushes one of these mech pilots and then steals the source of their power. And it seemed like that's what they were going for. But in this episode, uh, what we saw is one of the people that he went after like him, was actually driven by revenge. She was mad at our main character for defeating her friend, the last paladin we saw an episode or two ago. And so we get to see what happens to people in these mechs when they let something like anger or revenge take them over, and they actually transform into this dragon-like mech that I uh, sent the image of today. And we know that the dragon in this series is that super weapon that destroyed our main character's planet. And so it was kind of interesting because our main character keeps identifying himself as an Avenger, an Avenger, an Avenger. And now we kind of see what happens to people if they adopt that mindset a little too strictly. They become this berserking creature that just like can't be controlled and they end up hurting the people they love. And so it was a nice little foil to, to see what can happen if he lets this dangerous mindset take control of him instead of trying to find a new home on earth with the new friends he's making at like school and at home. Um, aside from that plot wise, uh, we actually find out that the main leader of the paladins, the mechs that these people are piloting is actually planning on using that dragon 
to kind of create his own rule on earth to kind of create uniform laws and regulations and stuff so he can stop conflict on earth and of course that's a very dangerous mindset and instead of that just kind of riding out we actually see a couple of the paladins willingly give up their mechs they're like i don't want to go along with this this isn't what i signed up for and i thought that was kind of nice because the plot was definitely getting a little stale there was definitely a formula that was flowing from episode to episode and now four or five episodes in we're getting this huge shift in the way the plot's going to work so i appreciate that i think i had just enough of the way the the story was going now and now they've completely changed the direction so i've kind of got this like new hunger for more episodes for this series um and yeah i mean like i mentioned before sound design is stellar uh animation since they do focus on cg a lot sometimes the mech fights can get a little clunky which is kind of a shame because like the designs of the mechs are very simple and restrained and i feel like that normally would give people more room for dynamic action and animation and stuff since it's not so hard to animate more simple shapes yeah but it seems like the cg is still kind of holding it back but aside from that the the music the sound design the character designs especially is kind of saving the series for me right now so i'm still excited to see more and it seems like the plot's going places so I'm happy with it. It's good to see. I might binge watch it once it's done, because uh, it seems to be getting better and better. And I just love the designs of the, of the different characters too. Like, yeah, that's an great. episode for me. So that would be pretty cool to watch. Well, on that note, uh, let's see. We've got a few more shows uh, that we can talk about. Um, so let's get back to something that Deanna is watching, so she can chat about it. Uh, we rent Suku Mogami. The slower I say it, the better I can be at pronouncing it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you did mention before you had dropped Homes of Kyoto to watch this instead because it's got some of the same themes, but a lot better uh, art style for you to, you know, keep your interest going. So how how's it been so far? How was this episode? Uh, this episode, it had a clear path to follow um, for the mystery. And so they also brought in the client from last episode, Um he was kind of like the referral to the client for this episode. So I thought that was uh, really cool because, you know, these characters don't really disappear. It just shows how connected everyone is and it makes the world seem like believable. That's good. Yeah. Um, so this week's uh, mystery was basically these skumagami. Um, they kind of like switch places in these scrolls or paintings. So the client is like trying to figure out like why that's happening. Like, is someone, you know, playing a prank on him? And so the siblings, they they have their main cast of Skumagami to like investigate. And um, I guess the Skumagami, they, they're they fighting over that one picture right there. She is Princess Kaguya. Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with who she is, but she's from the tale of the bamboo tree cutter which is basically like uh i guess this old man or something he finds princess kaguya who came from like the moon and stuff so um princess kaguya kaguya she she's like sad for some reason and the skumagami are trying to figure out why and then they get into like these arguments which is why they kind of like go into different scrolls when morning comes because they're like so flustered and they've been arguing all night and so they finally realize that um princess kaguya is sad because she can't really see the moon and so one of the main skumogami um he's like known for being like a moon scroll so and his his head is like a moon too so he like goes to where she is and like sits on a tree and like kind of just glows and then then she starts crying and she's like, oh, thank you for like showing me the moon and stuff. So I thought that was really cute. Oh, nice. So <laughs> it seems like each episode is going to focus on one of the main Skumogami characters. So like the first episode was about the bat Skumogami. And then this one is about the moon shaped um, Skumogami. And then there's also an undercurrent of a story that will probably unfold near the end, which is um, the siblings, or at least Oka, the sister, she's trying to find this guy named Suo, and the Skumogami know who he is, know who he is too. But um, the brother kind of gets angry at the mention of his name. So I'm assuming like 
Suo is either someone that raised the siblings or he's going to play a big role later on. So I'm curious to see how that will unfold. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty yeah. cool. Like, it kind of reminds me a bit of like Gigi no Katara and that some of the characters, not all of them, do occur in later episodes, which keeps it knowing that this, you know, this world is, you know, all connected. And it's bizarre when you see someone appear in one episode and gone forever in the next. So it's nice that they continue to like focus in, uh, not just focus in, but at least keep them uh, associated with the series. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's uh, already. It sounds like you're way more interested in this than Homes of Kyoto, so that's good to find something you can like uh, bounce off of and find mm -hmm. something even better. Well, let's keep that supernatural theme going. New show, you're checking out a brand new show. It's got a hell of a title: Muyo and Roji's Bureau of Supernatural Investigation. How was? <laughs> did you just did you catch up all the way on that show, or did you just watch the first episode or two? first episode actually just came out oh okay. so I didn't know that. yeah i was actually waiting since the season started because this kind of caught my eye with like the character designs and we talked i was familiar it. with the characters from an old game i used to play on the ds uh jump superstars and so that i was like oh, i'll check this out um first episode was actually very very strong uh basically the the plot is like the title implies there's these two characters Muhio and Roji and they run a supernatural investigation bureau and what they do is basically punish uh spirits and ghosts that commit crimes in their real world because there's like a supernatural law that these characters kind of uphold by exercising these spirits uh and in this episode kind of like how most of these exorcism anime go they're visited by a random person who's being haunted uh, you find out about their their past and who's being or what's haunting them, what kind of spirit they are, and then you see the main character be a badass at the end of the episode and exercise the spirit. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it was very interesting though. Like the the series has two pretty interesting protagonists. Like they're very good foils for each other. You've got uh, Muhio, which is like the little tiny guy who actually performs the exorcisms, and he's kind of this condescending jaded kind of an asshole and then you have uh roji who's the tall blonde one who's more of a people person like more involved with the advertising of their investigation bureau and so they play off each other in very interesting ways like at the end of the episode their um their client that they helped is trying to meet up with them and thank them but muhio has this law where once we help a client we need to distance ourselves we can't talk to them again or anything like that and i'm assuming maybe because they could draw in more spirits of this person. It could be dangerous. And then you see Roji try and disguise himself to go out and like meet with the person. And so it's like this nice little dynamic that's playing off between the two of them. Uh, if I had, or something else I actually really liked was there's two very distinct color palettes. Like the shot that I shared with you guys today was like very bright and colorful. And that's kind of how the story looks when they're just kind of minding their own business, living their day-to-day -day lives. But as soon as it becomes like time to exercise a spirit, the palette becomes very dark gray, purple, like dark blues. And it's got these two very distinct feels to it, which I really appreciate. Kind of like how Mob Psycho, like when they're exercising a spirit, the animation becomes very like psychedelic and trippy. It's kind of the same way. And I actually see a lot of parallels between this show and shows like Mob Psycho. So I really like that. Uh, if I had to pick a couple of gripes I have with it, um, one thing that I wasn't really huge on was they reused uh, a certain shot of animation a few times. Like every time Muhio has to perform this spell to oust like a spirit, they kind of reuse the same can shot of him like opening his book and reciting a spell and shooting this little beam at the spirit and they kind of replayed that shot three or four times and i'm hoping that's not like a trend that continues on um and aside from that it it kind of seems like right now he has a spell for everything <laughs> like Didn't every situation he yeah exactly like every situation he comes across he's like oh and he opens his book and he's got like the perfect spell to deal with it and Is i it hope like house md or something like that like he's always got the solution at the very end like a, a deus ex yeah machina. Exactly. And I hope it's like a very soft magic system where there's no real like rules or laws or anything like that. It's just kind of like the character has the spells he has and he has like an unlimited amount that you just don't really know about. But it seems like they're building up for something more like in the beginning and end of the episode, they're hinting at a much larger 
grand scale narrative. And it seems like he's not going to be able to just pull a spell out of his ass and get out of that one. So I'm interested to see where it's going. The characters are very interesting. The color palette, the designs, everything really about it so far, I'm really, really into, except for those two small gripes I have. So this is actually something I'm really looking forward to watching more of as it continues. Yeah, it's kind of, I was looking it up, uh, and it's kind of crazy to think that this is a um, a series that began as a manga back in 2004, uh, and it was- Yeah, really it's quite old. Then. Yeah, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's quite old, but it's definitely one that I think people kind of gave up on sort of an anime adaptation, uh, but it just started with a new manga run, so I guess that was enough to convince them, but- Oh, but, I didn't know that. Yeah, it just, it kind of, it's like Gigi no Katara, it's that, it just, they start up a new series, but- um, yeah, it started in March, apparently. Uh, the, it's a, a new chapter on that. It just means that they've got a lot of material to work with, which is good. Yeah, so, which is good. I'm actually glad to hear that there's a more uh, there's more manga coming out, because I was interested in checking that out. And also, I was going to say, Zach, you should definitely check this one out, because if you like Kataro, I think you're going to really like this one. Very similar like feel and genre behind it. I'm digging the, uh, the character design, and so I might definitely give it a try then, because I assume Katara will be ending sometime soon. I'll still need that supernatural fix, so I might do that. Yeah, soon. or just rewatch Mob Psycho, because that's a masterpiece. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that too, because uh, they've got... What's, <laughs> is it a new season or a new movie coming out with Mob Psycho? What's it? That they've season got? two. Season two, yeah. I keep yep, and I'm stuff. stoked. <laughs> I, I, I need to watch I need to watch the rest of that. I watched a, most of that series. I have not seen the last few episodes, so I probably need to do that. So do it. So it's not my bad. Uh I think that we've gone through most of the shows that we've we're, we're gonna talk about. Uh once again, Kataro, I did not watch, so we're not gonna see that. So I think we're gonna wrap things up then with uh, Attack on Titan. <laughs> so we've got it on the gun pointing right at us. Uh <laughs> so Deanna how was the last episode? It seemed like it was pretty lightweight. They had uh, Levi um, showing up, so they cleaned the place to make it look good. Uh, but now we've got a gun pointed at us. What's going on here? So the action for this episode was God tier. <laughs> wow. uh, it really was. Yeah, it was basically Levi versus Kenny and his crew. And then we get a moment in which Armin has to kill a human for the first time uh, because Jean the coward that he is hesitated but then i guess i guess you can't really call him a coward because you know he saw like the other person hesitate too so i guess um he's like the most compassionate out of the group i don't know but armin still called him out for it <laughs> um but yeah i really liked the action i liked that scene when of levi slamming the shotgun on the counter at the bar um and then that poor bartender, he was so shocked. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the changes because I also heard that this arc wasn't the most exciting, uh, despite Levi being in the spotlight. Um, so far, the story has been pulling me in uh, because now we're dealing with like humans versus humans, and not really Titans. So um, we'll probably see more of like Armin's uh, how he how he's affected by his first human kill and like how that will affect his decisions later on Oof. um and also just like that poor kid he's just he so he disguised himself as historia as like a decoy or whatever and this creepy old guy just starts like molesting him <laughs> what? and i'm just like i felt so i felt so uncomfortable and i was like armin i'm so sorry <laughs> poor kid got molested and has to kill someone in the span of two episodes yeah oh so i'm just God. like protect him please <laughs> it, what, what did they confuse him for a girl or is it just that it was being creepy that's all it was well he, he was a decoy like he was supposed to um throw off the the enemies like Tailing them and stuff. Oh, so okay. Yeah. yeah. So he, yeah, he like dressed up as a woman, and then yeah. the kid, okay. <laughs> the guy believed it a little too readily. <laughs> oh my god. He's like, your body feels so manly. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and John's just looking at him like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So awkward. Okay. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Okay, that's wow. Yeah, it's, it's it's. I like. <laughs> I like where the the show's going though, like with the whole humans versus humans thing. They're treating it very well. Like they didn't just start killing each other left and right. They're actually like really grappling with taking the life of a human because all they've been doing so far has been like for humanity and now they're actually killing their own kind. And even Levi near the end is like, 
I can't really tell you if what we're doing is right. We might be in the wrong here. Everyone's kind of in a moral gray area right now. And uh, it's also especially interesting because you see Kenny like the exact opposite. When he's taking lives, he's like cracking one liners <laughs> and like jumping into the bar and doing like funny cowboy poses and just like being a general comedian about the whole thing. And then you see like Armin having this crisis because he just took a life. And then you see characters like Kenny just having the time of his life. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's a very interesting dynamic. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> That's a. It definitely went places, as you said. Uh, but it's good to hear that the animation continues to be great. Uh, but, you know, season oh, yeah. three, I'm sure the budget's just through the roof now for them. So they can do a lot with that than they used to. Yeah. Uh, also, Zach, don't you dare forget about High Score Girl. Nope. I, yeah, totally, I almost, I almost forgot. I almost forgot about <laughs> that. I'm so sorry. Uh, High Score Girl. Cause I, it's because I watched it this morning, so I almost forgot. But, yeah. Man. Great episode. And so, uh, I kind of like, it started off trying to, you know, so there's a bit of a time skip going on here, I guess. Uh, they talked about uh, the release of all these different versions of Street Fighter 2, which I kind of remember from back then, because uh, I was born in the late 80s. So I, I kind of got some uh, remembrance of that time period. Uh, I liked how they were like, 92, Bill Clinton wins the election. 92, uh, 93, he's sworn in uh, all this time, like Super Street Fighter, Hyper Street Fighter, uh, all <laughs> different editions coming out here. So this episode is something that we talked about before, uh, but we get introduced to the blonde-haired girl, uh, Hidaka, whose father runs a liquor store that just got a set of arcade cabinets. So you kind of see where this is going. So, uh, you know, Haru, uh, they kind of meet each other because Hidaka kind of, you know, she spends her nights not doing a whole lot, just studying or helping her parents uh, run the store or just kind of, you know, the typical stuff that you would do at that age. Uh, sans video games and so Haro being the the bad influence that he is convinces her to start playing arcade games uh which is a terrible thing to do uh but it was pretty refreshing to finally have someone who speaks uh, you know as a counterpart <laughs> to Haro. Uh, that was the best part and it's that um uh, you know now they he has someone to really talk to instead of just the grunts and groans that ono would sometimes give which you know still it makes her a very endearing person in her own right but it was just kind of nice to have someone he could talk converse with uh like a uh like a typical chat like they would have rather than nonverbal communication so uh i i did like how haru when he first saw super street fighter 2 uh that reaction is very realistic because people went nuts when those when that game came out when they showed ryu uh doing that his little dancing jig because it had like cloth physics that you didn't really see. And they were also talking about the release of Virtual Fighter, the first polygonal game uh, that, you know, blew, blew people's minds. Kind of reminded me of back then, like the, to the point when I, when I was old enough to really know about that stuff, it was when the release of Final Fantasy VII came out and people seeing CG for the first time. It was insane to see it. Uh, and I was about uh, eight or nine years old when they were showing that stuff off. So uh, it just kind of showed how people were crazy about that stuff back then going from 2d to 3d um and it's it's still you know everything's been very heartwarming you know it's been like an adorable show with these very genuine characters uh i but i know once ono reappears it's gonna start to get pretty sad and so i'm, I'm kind of concerned because they are getting pretty close together like hidaka of course sees a lot in in haru I don't know why people are so attracted to this nerd, but you know, it's I guess it's, um, it's some guy who's passionate about something, and I guess that's enough for some people, like to see someone so crazy about uh, these things. But yeah, just pound for pound, just a, another great episode. Once again, shocks me to think that this is a CG show because you can't really tell. It's done so well that it seems like a very uh, 2D style, uh, and I and it's just been so so enjoyable it's a, definitely one of this i guess this will be my third show that i just really look forward to seeing a new episode every week not just because i'm a big video game nerd but because the characters are so well done uh what were your thoughts on this new show uh i really like this episode i was genuinely surprised to see them take this route with it like the time skip and oh no it's actually gone and yeah. like we knew because of the opening that they were going to be introducing this second girl but i didn't expect it to happen like this yeah, but he clearly still misses her because they have a like a bit of a moment there when she picks Zangief, yeah, which I thought was a really nice moment. But I'm already a huge fan of this new character. Like, oh, yeah. like you said, it's very refreshing to have someone who actually talks and you. It's a little more believable their connection, and also like you mentioned, like why these people are getting 
like infatuated with this like dweeb but it seems <laughs> like i feel like it's happening because he's so like you said just passionate about what he cares about and just like these two characters are both very involved with school and like even though one of them had their parents enforcing these laws on him and he is more like self-imposing these restrictions and limitations and then you have this guy who's just very free and carefree and just cares about what he cares about unabashedly and unapologetically and i think that's maybe what's drawing these people to him and so i don't know i find it kind of believable and i'm excited to see more of this relationship develop between the two but i know ultimately i'm going to be heartbroken when oh no eventually comes back and and they have to say goodbye because that's what the the opening is at least heavily implying yeah, I'm, I'm uh, like personally, I'm I'm very interested to see like how Ono will change. It's weird to be talking about her so much, but you know she only left just last episode. So, um, mm-hmm. but like how much Los Angeles, <laughs> which is a shitty place to be, uh, changed. <laughs> it's uh, you know, because uh, she's probably going to be around people that aren't really into video games. Uh, so she'll be like swept to that life uh, once again, unless she kind of snuck away to play video games like that. I, I hope that they kind of address that. Uh, pretty heavily i've not read the manga just a few first few volumes so i'm, I'm going to be interested to see what they do there but um yeah hidaka immediately a great character she's a very charming person and it's going to be interesting to see what what happens there once again you know just just i love i just love the animation so much in this series and I, it's mm-hmm. exciting to see what they do with that definitely something i look forward to every week yeah yeah absolutely uh they've got some interesting lines uh but yeah <laughs> i think that that's that does cover it, right? Yeah, I forgot to erase Homes of Kyoto. too. That's, that's been dropped, so we'll get rid of that. But yeah, uh, we'll move into... You can't oh, I'm sorry. free. <laughs> oh, free. <laughs> oh, I totally forgot about the message. I'm sorry. How dare the you? The most important show. You guys got to speak up on these things. <laughs> it's about free. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot about the Muscles Magazine. Uh, I like how the thumbnail for our show is the, the Muscles Magazine from last week. But yeah uh how was free deanna sorry okay i'll just go through it pretty quickly but so that guy right there is hiori and he is the best friend police um he is the person who's getting in the way of haru and his friends from reuniting with ikuya and so it was kind of like basically he was just saying you think you deserve to be his friend race me bitch (laughs) (laughs) so he races he races with makoto who's um, they both specialize in backstroke swimming, so they had a race, and um, yeah, it's just I think Hiori won, but Makoto definitely like gave a run for his money. So the show continues to look gorgeous with scenic backgrounds, and hopefully, um, oh yeah, also this is so important. But that guy Hiori, he. He literally broke Haru at the end of the episode by saying, everyone who swims with you ends up suffering. And I was just like, damn, who are you? Like, <laughs> you guys. Wow. So, wow. yeah, there's going to be a lot of tension. And I'm just, yeah, hopefully they all make up by the end of it. <laughs> That's the series in a nutshell. There's always so much tension going on in this show. Yeah. As someone who watched like, the first two seasons, it's definitely like that. Uh, wow. Okay, I think... <laughs> on that note, I think we've got them all now. I'm so uh, it's just that we've got more shows here than we're actually watching, so I sometimes got confused about that. So, and also it's getting really hot in my room. Uh, okay. Yeah, same. I think I think we can actually move on then to talk about Try Again. So yeah, it's things are getting pretty crazy right now uh, with this show. We're in episode nine and ten. So this is the episode that we finally get introduced to Wolfwood, who is the priest. Who carries around this gigantic crucifix? Uh, not that they're always small; it's always gigantic in any case. But yeah, uh, I've seen so many images of this character, so it's finally cool to see him. Uh, you know, uh, in the show itself, uh, he's clearly a very good-hearted person because he, you know, looks after everybody else like a, a good priest would. Uh, and it's it's nice to see someone here who's got sort of the same uh, personality that try uh, that Bash has. So uh, I did like that quite a bit. And it adds another level of dimension to the story that, that you know, is already completely capturing my interest here. Uh, so there was a lot of great moments in this um, that I, I was liking. 
uh, you know, everything from, you know, being picked up and having to fend off, uh, uh, you know, all these robots, I guess, which was kind of crazy. They alluded to that this is something from the past as well, kind of like the last episode where, you know, he had this, uh, Vash had this long lost technology, which was like a walkie talkie, a miniature one. So they continue to, you know, allude to these things that were happening before. And he seemed kind of like, uh, you know, melancholy about the fact that he was blowing these things up. So I don't know if maybe they were once, uh, clearly they were once protecting maybe people uh, uh you know protecting places because they said you don't have your id so you can't enter and so everyone's like wait what we're, we're just kind of kind of get away from you we don't care about an id or whatever so um i i thought that was pretty interesting to hear uh and i i obviously it means we're getting into it um i think my favorite moment of this of this in these episodes was was when uh wolfwood came in and sat down next to millie and wanted to go to, re- uh, to go to bed uh go to sleep and he kind of leans himself against millie's shoulder and she's like oh <laughs> she, she doesn't know how to react to that uh it, it was a very cute moment with that and it's it's also interesting to point out that episode 11 uh the title of the show uh, of the episode is called escape from pain so i think we're getting into it <laughs> we're getting into it uh what were your thoughts on this new show i already love wolfwood he's such a perfect partner for vash because it seems like like uh, repentance is like a huge theme for this show and oh, he's yeah. very much a character who kind of embodies that he's like carrying this giant crucifix around he's a man of god like he's trying to outrun this past that he also uh is i'm sure remorseful for and then as someone who's kind of coming from the same background as vash he's able to call him out on his shit like when vash is sitting outside of that bus and he goes why do you always smile like that like i can tell that's a fake smile yeah and that's very in line with what we were talking about before where it's like when he turned away those women who were looking to sleep with him is like he puts on this front in this act but a lot of that is fake he's just trying to get by day to day and so wolfwood is a character who's great just because he's able to call him out for that and also like design wise he's also just great like you've got vash who's got this like bright red coat long blonde hair and then you have wolfwood who's like this dark blue coat and then like short black hair just like design wise they're perfect complements to each other yeah um i didn't recognize vash when he woke up from sleep i was like who's this guy (laughs) yeah yeah he's like all hot and handsome when he wakes up from (laughs) his hair is down (laughs) yeah and i like the little scene of him training like where he's like balancing the egg on the gun i thought that was a really nice touch um but yeah plot wise it's also very interesting we're learning more about vash and his connection to lost technology and there's also that moment where the creature, not creature, the, the robot is like about to gun him down. And then just before he kills him, he says, there's nobody left to protect. And so I'm wondering what that line is supposed to mean. Like maybe he remembers these guards and what were they protecting before? Is he like a different race of people that's gone extinct or yeah. like maybe he's like some alien creature. Not sure that's where the plot was going, <laughs> but now I don't even know anymore with like lost technology and. Like, his arm was smoking at the end of that interaction yeah, with the robot. What, what was that? So, like, I'm wondering, like, there's there's clearly more than just what meets the eye. It's not just, like, a Western gun em down show. There's something else behind the scenes here that I'm excited to learn more about. But, yeah, Wolfwood was a great, great character, and I'm excited to see more of his interactions with Vash. And hopefully we get to see more of the real Vash with now that he's able to interact with someone who's from the same cloth as him but what did you think diana yeah wolfwood and <clears throat> sorry wolfwood and vash they're a great duo awesome teamwork um i also feel like we have this sort of parallel where wolfwood he's a prius so he kind of represents religion whereas vash um he can control technology apparently so he represents science so i'm kind of curious to see how that parallel will continue to play into the story And then also, um, I feel like you guys, I love Wolfwood, but I feel like he's going to die in later episodes. Like when you're so, when you're so, (laughs) when you're so attached to a character, like, and he's not the main character, like, you know, something's going to happen to him. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Um, but I get the same vibe. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the vibe, but at the same time, like, yeah, it's, 
I don't know. Like, it, it seems like he'd be the guy who's like, you think he's dead, but he's not. You know, like he escapes from certain death situations. But like, I don't know. Maybe everyone dies. Uh, it's hard to say in this world. <laughs> Maybe everyone dies. Yeah. Not to keep it morbid. I don't know. <laughs> Just keep, let's keep a good attitude about it. Episode but, title. Yes, everyone does. It's, yeah. Also, did you guys notice the black cat? has been in almost every episode so far. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did he, like, pull him out of his bag or something like that? Yeah. That episode? yeah. And then, like, that one scene where it has, like, wide eyes and just, like, staring out into the night or something. Yeah, yeah. On top yeah. of the train that one time, too. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if it's, like, a metaphor for, like, Bash's it, misfortune or something. <laughs> it is. I think it's just that he's always got bad luck all around with him. You know, he's, he's, he's carrying that around. So I, the cat, I'm sure it's just supposed to be, like, not quite a mascot character or something, but I assume that's just all it is, but... Who knows? I haven't seen it. So that was a great part, though. That was a great little touch on that moment, and I like the the dynamic about the little um, the uh, the tournament that they got into. That you know, at the end, they have to shoot each other, and that's like, now what do we do? And of course, uh, there's this moment where Wolf has to take Dane seriously because he needs to protect this family, which I thought was weird because it seemed like when he shot the guy in the window, like he could have probably done that anytime. And so I didn't know what was <laughs> going on there. Um, but I guess any way to fool them to bring out everybody else so that they don't risk having someone else show up and, and take and try to kill that family. But I thought it was a, it was a really interesting episode and i think that angle maybe goes to show that at some point wolfen might turn on vash and it makes i guess it, it's kind of clear that that will eventually happen at some point but right now i continue to like it i still like meryl and millie a lot like i think they're two of the best characters in the show right now which i guess there's not too many characters to begin with but uh i, I like millie how helpful she's been and how sharp she is still calling out things uh, kind of uh, with a sense of aloofness uh She's extremely perceptive, and even Vash addressed that last episode where he's like, you know, she's way sharper than she probably even knows. So, uh, you know, I'm looking to her to tell me what's going on sometimes and, and to realize what's happening. So, once again, great couple episodes, but things look like they're getting a little more dramatic, which, you know, uh, that's enough when we're going into what would normally be the end of a season. So, we'll see what happens here. So, yeah, with that... We get to the end of this edition of Anime Review. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Nushant and Deanna for being a part of this. Uh, and yeah, next week we'll catch up with episode 11 and 12 of Trigun along with the other shows that we've watched in this season. But thank you all out there for watching. Uh, and thank you all there, of course, for listening to, to this podcast. Catch us next week for yet another edition of Anime Review. Bye, everyone. Later. Bye.